Welcome to Out With Dan, the podcast that spotlights and examines the voices of LGBTQ plus authors, characters, and our allies. Together, we lift our voices and we tell our stories. I'm Dan White. Join me as I chat with this week's author. Hello and welcome back to Out With Dan. Today, I'm excited to talk to New York Times bestseller, Lana Harper about In Charm's Way. Welcome, Lana. Say hi. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. What a delicious, wonderful spell you've cast on this book. I love it. Thank you. This is, I <laughs> yes. This is the fourth installment in this series. Is that correct? That's right. So this is the fourth installment in the Witches of Thistle Grove, uh, which started with Payback's the Witch. So they've been coming since 2021 now, which is kind of wild to think about. Um, I had originally thought it was going to be a trilogy. Uh, that was the that was the initial contract with Berkeley. So I was prepared, you know, to leave that world after those three books. Um, and then it turned out I was going to get to write at least two more. So it was a wonderful, happy surprise. Uh, this is the first uh, couple that I didn't originally have envisioned since for that first okay. contract, I did have the first three couples for the first three books and the general concepts planned. So this was the first time I kind of went off book and had a chance to think about who I'd like to explore next. I love that. I love that. Delilah is just delicious. And we see at the beginning of the book that she's sort of lost her way for a lack of a better term. Do you want to give a better term for that? What's sure. happened with Delilah? So Delilah, um, this is the first time this happens in such a direct way. Uh, Delilah is experiencing the after effects of a spell that actually happened in the previous book. So this book is more directly chronologically tied to the events of the past book than has been the case so far. So she was hit with a pretty nasty, uh, what's called an oblivion glamour in the book. So a memory erasing spell for various nefarious reasons um, that, you know, you'd have to read the previous in, um, um <laughs> back in a spell in order to know exactly what happened. But she is a very ferociously independent, uh, very bristly, very self-sufficient individual. And so suddenly having this moment where she can't trust her mind anymore and her mind has never failed her. She is the ultimate scholar. That's what she does. She doesn't rely on other people. And suddenly she can't remember spells that she's known her whole life. Even worse, sometimes she can't remember what regular objects are. So this kind of um, complete discombobulation that is so, you know, so destabilizing for someone who's used to being in control of everything. So she is now in a position where she has to rely on her best friend. She has to be working with the witch who caused this harm in the first place. So that's just <laughs> a very thorny tangle of emotions for her. She needs this person's help. But at the same time, it's very difficult for her to be in the position of, you know, seeing her face every single day like you did this to me and now I have to deal with you. Um, and I really wanted this journey of kind of um, both that rage and that difficulty with your own mind. Part of it is based on some physical experiences that I had that were fortunately nowhere near anything that Delilah is going through. But I really wanted kind of to track what does that make you feel like when you suddenly have to rely on people for things that you took for granted and really valued about yourself for so much of your life. There is there's a situation that I won't be giving anything away, but there's a situation with a house key and it is something that we take for granted in our everyday mm -hmm. life that just becomes something that is so debilitating in a scene for Delilah. And it is one of those things that, I mean, what a beautiful job you did with that. Mm -hmm. It was, it showed exactly what we go through when something happens that we don't remember, something just simple that we don't remember. And it really was so engaging. Um, it so I, you know what we learn to rely on ourselves and then have to rely on other people it becomes really quite cagey and and very frightening at times i i think that's um i was originally not going to make her um 
condition quite that debilitating and that I was like, you know what, let's really push her to the brink because <laughs> she's going to have to do something that goes against her grain to a very, very significant degree because a lot of her identity is built around this role as the heir to kind of the uh, the record keeping um, legacy of the Harlows. So I really needed her to be just on her last nerve. Like she had to be like, <laughs> I, I absolutely had, this is my last resort. This is my Hail Mary. I need to have my mind back. And that was where the scene with the key came in where something that easy, that obvious just threw her for that kind of loop. And it did feel normally I don't like to start my books with such a barrage of negativity where she has, you know, that very first scene, she forgets the spell and then the key comes pretty shortly thereafter. So we're getting to see how unsteady she is. Um, and this is based uh, just I'm comfortable talking about this. And I again, it wasn't it wasn't as anywhere near as terrible as what she's going through. But I briefly um, had to stop taking some medication that I had been taking for many years. And it affected me in a way that I completely didn't anticipate. And no one prepared me for how difficult it was going to be. I just had no support. And suddenly, basic life tasks and things that I had to do were, were incredibly hard to do. And just admitting that to myself and talking to other people about it felt embarrassing and shameful and just kind of like this tragic thing that I had to go through what felt like both by myself and also through forced dependence on other people. So I, as much as I hated to put Delilah through like not knowing what a key was, I really also needed her to be on the brink of that major decision that she makes. I think in real life, you know, um, it, it's sort of mirrored by the fiction here, but in real life we have we have situations that we've come to depend on ourselves. And then when that footing is pulled out from under us, it, it, it's, it's very daunting. It's very frightening. And so we got to see in this, in Delilah's instance, a reality that really can affect all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's many different ways where we can get there, right? It doesn't necessarily no. have to be an intellectual or even mental thing. Sometimes it's a purely physical thing and there's just so many things that could throw us off balance. So I think the idea of that vulnerability and then how to deal, especially if it, I mean, very rarely do things like this, I think in the real world happen because directly because of someone else's actions. But Delilah does have that sort of very direct cause and effect situation where she can trace exactly why this happened to her. Someone is guilty for this. <laughs> and so she has to make, yeah, she's like, it's you. And now I have to see your face. So she has to make a decision. What do I value more? This absolute and justified rage that I feel towards you or some manner of healing that will require me to find a way to forgive you, not because you necessarily deserve it or earned it, but because I need it, because I can't live like this any longer. So that was something that I wanted to make sure no one thought that I was excusing the perpetrator's actions or saying mm -hmm. that it's wrong to be angry. If you, you know, sometimes anger is incredibly useful, but if it's just eating you up that way from the inside, you know, it, it's one of those things that there are different ways to approach. How do we move past it? How do we make it more useful? Is it serving us? That kind of thing. I love it. I especially love Ivy. You know, Ivy is the friend that Delilah relies on and Ivy is what is it the ride or die i mean ivy's in it for the long haul and that was such i love that i love seeing characters who are supportive and loving did you enjoy writing ivy i love ivy um and i love her for a number of reasons one of them is that um i just love the thorns in general they're one of the four magical families and i really enjoy that sort of nature-based healing system but that doesn't have to mean that they're just like light and love all the time. I mean, Ivy is there for Delilah constantly, but she is also ready to call her out for being selfish <laughs> or for, you know, for taking too much or for being, you know, not not being as forthcoming and not keeping up her end of their friendship bargain. So I appreciated giving her that kind of dimension. Um, sometimes a love interest becomes sort of uh, a dominant character to uh, the exclusion of other characters. And I felt that it was very important to give Ivy her due. I also really like the idea of a former romantic partner being your best friend. That's not something I think I see in fiction a ton. Nope. 
and especially if it's um, if it's a queer relationship that involves into a friendship, the idea of like, you know, they had a relationship, it was lovely, now they're friends, that's lovely too. It doesn't have to be some sort of complicated thing. This is a relationship pathway that some people experience. So those were two of my favorite things about Ivy and then also kind of setting her up perhaps to be uh, a character in the next book because I wanted her story to be out there as well. Yes, perhaps, nice. maybe. <laughs> well, I support that. And it doesn't have to be the next, it could be the one mm -hmm. after that. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, let's do that, yeah. <laughs> I love that. And I, I agree with you. I don't think I've seen, uh, seen it very often in fiction that a ex-romantic partner becomes a best friend. And that was nice because it really in life, we have all different kinds of relationships. Mm -hmm. Some last, some don't last, some are a week, some are a lifetime. It's hard to know. And it is nice to see an evolution in mm -hmm. that type of, of friendship. So now we get on to Kat, who is um, yes. very, very different. So, uh, so, can you give an idea of what a fae is? Yeah, so fae is, there's a lot of really funny reels and memes about this, and it's typically making fun of the way that fantasy writers can spell fae or fairies in whichever <laughs> way they feel like any combination of vowels will do. Like, you can have A-E, E-Y, E-I, like, whatever you want. So she is, a, in her instance, she is a subtype of what we would call fairy or fae folk but she's specifically a cat she, which is this very obscure type of uh, Celtic cat fairy, sort of like a okay. were cat. Um, and I had read about them briefly years ago and I was like, that's cool. Like I've never really heard about these anywhere else. And so it's kind of nice when you have that mythology to work with because there's not a ton of lore that's like binding you any which way. You can sort of be like, well, here, I've done some research on what these are supposed to be, but it's like, fairly spotty anyway, so it gives you a lot of room to play with. And in Kat's case, and there's obviously a play on words there, her name is Katrina, and this <laughs> is done intentionally and is part of, I wasn't unaware that she's Kat the Cat, she like, it, it was done on purpose, <laughs> have no fear, it was supposed to be cheesy. But uh, I, I also had the fact that she was half human, and so she had a different sort of manifestation that you would expect from a full-blooded catchy fae. Um, and she was interesting for me to write because one, I'm a total sucker for these morally ambiguous love interests. I find them <laughs> so enjoyable because it's like, as the reader even, you're like, ooh, sexy, but you know something's off almost from the beginning. You can feel the vibe. The vibe is not safe, even though, you know, everything seems to be proceeding a certain way. So I really, really liked that she allowed me to inject a little bit more of that uncertainty into Delilah's life, just to hold up a mirror to her. Like, here's the difference between Kat and everyone else whom you're kind of purposely shutting out of your life. And then also Kat is a doorway to this broader world of magic that exists outside of Thistle Grove. So we know that it's not just Thistle Grove existing kind of like a magical spot as a vacuum in a, in a world that is otherwise completely empty of magic. So she served a lot of really fun purposes for me and she was really fun to write. I just enjoy the rogues. I love that. And and I do think that, you know, at least for me, I'm only going to speak for me. You know, sometimes it's the bad boy or the one that yeah. shouldn't be is, of <laughs> course, the one that I'm most interested in <laughs> because it's like, you know, it, it, it might be something I would like to be or you know, mm -hmm. what it, it's always attractive, you know, to wonder how far into the trap you can stick your finger before you get caught. So exactly. it's a, it is one of those wonderful things. So one thing I want to talk about a little bit is tomes and omens. Uh, I feel like that you have at least 60 more books just in that bookstore <laughs> alone. <laughs> I'm so glad you feel that way. I love Tomes and Omens. I love it. It was one of the first places I invented in Thistle Grove, so I'm really glad you like it. I, well, and I think that, you know, as, as with all sort of older bookstores, uh, you have these things that are stuck back in the corner that you may not remember, and then it comes to pass that you need it now. And I think that that, when I was 
in reading the book, I was like, you know, this is just a treasure trove right here that Lana's got at her fingertips. <laughs> yes, I love writing Tomes and Omens. Um, it's not necessarily based on one real place, but I did live in uh, like right outside of Salem for two years. And if oh. you've ever been to Salem, Massachusetts, it is full of these occult bookstores and indie bookstores. So I sort of just blended them together. Like, let's have one that is all of these things at once. Um, and I, you know, the way that those places smell, sort of the incense and the old books and the, just the general vibe is so wonderful. Like I could spend an entire day in there buying like weird tarot decks and looking at all the, <laughs> both the, you know, random like bestsellers that are sometimes there next to like the Necronomicon, because sure, like, mm -hmm. why not have those things together? And I really like the idea that, you know, you have these two, there's the first floor that's open to just your average Thistle Grove tourist who's coming into shop. And then there's the attic where really only the Harlows have access to, and that's where they keep the records as is their part of their duty to the town. And they have a lot more memorabilia. They have all the occult kind of records of the four families going back to the founding of the town. And they have that shelf of forbidden books that they're keeping and that they're not supposed to be using. They're supposed to be <laughs> of course, like as soon as you have a shelf of forbidden books, someone's going to use one. And if you put one, if you put one in a book, it's going to get used pretty quickly. So I liked it. And I also really enjoyed, um, without giving too much away, at some point, Delilah has to do sort of a, a psychic spelunking into her own mind um, and the fact that her own mind sort of reflects the visuals of this environment that she's so familiar with was something that was really fun for me. It was almost kind of, I would say a little bit of wish fulfillment because it's like if I could choose what the inside of my mind looked like, I think I'd pick a place like that. <laughs> but make it full of like weird, interesting stuff like flowers and birds. So that's one of my favorite scenes in the book. Again, without going into too much detail, I really enjoyed doing that. I'm glad you feel it has so much more potential to be buying because I love spending time in Tomes and Omens and would happily do that. I So do I, so do I. And I, I mean, I think that we find that in these places that there are so many different options. Mm -hmm. And that of course is the thing that's so exciting about, you know, discovering learning about things that I don't necessarily know about or learning more about things I already know. So I, anytime there's a bookshop involved, I'm in it a hundred percent. So <laughs> I love the bookshops. I will say uh, even more than the bookshops. One of my favorite parts of working and developing Thistle Grove uh, was figuring out all of the foods like the various restaurants and what to call them and then populating the menus. I love thinking about food and I love, especially if it's <laughs> themed restaurants or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Like I have my list, like if this will grow over real, I know exactly where I'd go. If I were going for like a full weekend, like how would I stack up the restaurants? Where would I go first in terms of the family domains and all the attractions? Yeah. I'm just like a sucker for anything food <laughs> with, with a good, with a solid cheesy theme. I love it. I think after the sixth book, then comes, uh, then will come your book about Thistle Grove and what's in it. So, you know, you, you've got yet another one in you, I'm sure. Okay. Of it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Maybe it's just going to be a menu or maybe like a recipe <laughs> book. <laughs> <laughs> I've known a couple of authors who've yeah. actually done that. So yeah. that, that works. So you've written for both adults and young adults. Mm -hmm. You've written. So is one because i don't want to compare one against the other but are there are there challenges to one versus the other do they seem the same to you is yeah that's a great question um i think there are challenges so i started out writing young adult contemporary fantasy and i do feel like those were the first two books it was the wicked like a, a wildfire and fierce like a firestorm um and they were set in montenegro which is where my dad is from and where i spent a lot of my oh. summers Again, featuring witches, because I can't not write about witches. They have to be in there. It's it's what I do. Um, I <laughs> love writing those books. And in some ways, actually, those books are darker than these books. And they reflect the way that I like writing about magic, which is complex magical systems, usually pretty dark family histories. So I think they qualified as crossover books. Like they were technically for 13 to 18 year olds, but I think adults could have comfortably read them. Um, the thing that I didn't enjoy about writing them is 
you're sort of by virtue of the audience that you're writing for, typically those books don't let you have open door steamy scenes. You're not going to cover certain topics. Um, it might have changed. I mean, I know that YA is evolving, but at the time it was pretty clear that that wasn't what it was going to look like. And I don't like strictures on those things. Um, I especially really like sort of open door scenes and books because I think those are valuable scenes for a variety of reasons, not just for like titillating excitement, but because I think you can do a lot more. Um, you can further the plot, you can do emotional development, you can do a lot of things with them. Um, and I wanted to explore more adult concepts, like the kind of coming of age that happens when you're a little bit older than 17 or 18. Um, and so in that sense, I think it was, um, it felt like a more natural fit for me to be writing um, the adult books, which isn't to say I didn't love those. I really did. They were very enjoyable and I learned a lot about writing, especially those first two. So it's really more of a, um, yeah, it's, they paved the path to what I, I eventually wanted to be writing, and I'm very grateful that I got to write them. I love that, because I do think that, I, I know from speaking to YA authors, it, there is a bit of uh, um, constrictor that you, you mm -hmm. need to fit in this and that, and it's understandable because you have an audience, you know, and then, of course, I have talked to some YA authors who've said these type of rules and regulations are not reality-based because yeah. oftentimes um, YA are thinking the same thoughts as adults. They just don't always share them the same way adults share them. So I, you know, I see both sides. I, and I do applaud coming of age because it doesn't always happen at 15 and 16. Sometimes coming of age just means that we get a different mindset about exactly. where we're going to. I completely agree with that. Uh, it's just that sort of, there are so many different paradigm shifts we go through in life about ourselves and what we think we want. And some of the very important ones do happen during those early years. And they are, I think, in some ways, more emotionally poignant than the ones that happen later because all the feelings are intensified. So I think that's the, the really big draw in writing YA where all the feelings are so big nothing has yes. been wanted at all yet right so like all the cynicism anything that comes in later it just isn't a part of those books i will say i did try i'm a firm believer and i think that uh, sex should be on the page if you want it to be and if it works with a ya book so i kept trying to do that when i was writing the historical murderesses thrillers uh which were my next two ya books and so i would write these scenes and my editor would be like we're <laughs> 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 and I kept doing it, and she was like, "What? Well, I like these, but we just can't, okay? And I was like, I'm really sorry to be you like this. I really felt it just worked within the book. And she was like, I understand that you feel that way, but we're going to have to cut this. And so I was constantly reworking those scenes because I was like, the teens think about this stuff. They definitely, I promise. And she was like, I know, I understand, just for the purposes of this book. So I am always happy to see. And I understand both sides, right? Because there's sure. sure books sure. where... You know, it's not about that, and some teens aren't comfortable reading it, and that's perfectly fine. So I think the the need for a range there is probably the best idea. I agree because you know teens think of all different things. Mm -hmm. Sex is obviously a big part of it. Adults think of sex as a big part of their life as well. Yeah. But teens have so many emotions that they're experiencing, thoughts that are going through their head, and as you say, they're so intense because they don't have the experience of an adult. Um, so they're having to learn their way each time. So so do you have a website or social media you would like to share? Yes, so I'm the most active on Instagram and I'm at Lana Light on Instagram and that's L-A-N-A-L-Y-T-E. I have no idea why this is my handle. It meant something. <laughs> I should probably change it because I don't know what it means. And I, it was just a long time ago and I was like, ha, yeah, that's cool. So it clearly meant something to me at the time that I had forgotten. <laughs> and then I have a more obvious one for my website, which is also where a lot of the good info is. And that's just lanapopovicbooks.com. It's not Lana Perfect. Harper. It still harkens back to the time when I was writing under Lana Popovic. So both of those places are good resources. I'm on Twitter a little bit. I don't anticipate that I will be on. I've mostly been just 
on there to share news and now there's even less reason to be on there so i am mostly on <laughs> i'm mostly on instagram and on my website those are the places to kind of hit me up for anything that's coming perfect and also i will suggest to people to subscribe to your newsletter on your website yes. as well thank you for that reminder thank you yes, yes. I you as well see oh, <laughs> <laughs> should have, should have been yeah. on top of that one yes i do have a newsletter it's not very regular but when it does happen i'm really excited about it <laughs> There you go. That's it. Doesn't you know? It's one of those things. Is to be a tease. It is not a chore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it's a, it's a fun thing, and sometimes you know my work a day life gets in the way of it. But I do love writing it. So yes, please do subscribe if you have a chance and you feel like it. Yes. Again, the book is called In Charm's Way. Lana, I hope you have the very best of success with this. Thank you so much, and thank you again for having me. This was such a pleasure. Thank you. I feel the same way. Hang on for me just a second. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of Out with Dan. You can find more information about this podcast and its host at outwithdan.com, on Twitter at outwithdan, and on Instagram and Facebook at gooutwithdan. This podcast is hosted by Authors on the Air Global Radio Network, and the theme music is provided by bensound.com. Join us again soon for the next episode of Out with Dan.